Hello and welcome to the Bristol University Press webinar series, where today we'll be talking to Keith Dowding about his new book, It's the Government Stupid, uh, which has the, uh, this is the book, and the subtitle is How Governments Blame Citizens for Their Own Policies. I'm Stephen Wenham, the publisher for Politics at Bristol, and we're delighted to publish Keith's book and to have the chance to hear more from him about it today. Keith has written extensively and persuasively on many areas of politics and is particularly notable for the way in which he combines uh, political theory with empirical research. He has written on a range of topics from political power to the careers of cabinet ministers um, and he's currently the distinguished professor of polit political science and political philosophy at the Australian National University. Before this he was based at the London School of Economics for a number of years. Keith and I first discussed this book at um, what is now a dimly remembered, um, dimly remembered events uh, academic conference. And um, it was evident there that the ideas behind this book had been bubbling away in his mind for quite some time. Um, so the result is a book which is clearly written and forcefully argued. And so I'm sure we're in for a stimulating presentation from Keith, and I hope um, a lively question and answer session afterwards. Keith will talk for about 20 minutes um, and then we'll have a chance for your questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And if you have any technical issues, use the chat function and you can also um, find out how to order the book in chat as well. So thank you very much for joining us today. And now over to Keith. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, as you say, my... Um book is called It's the Government Stupid, um, and it's about how governments blame us for their own policies. The book is really about responsibility and how the cult of responsibility has gripped us such that whatever happens to us is, is our own responsibility. We, we, we're blamed. So, you know, present people in Britain are being blamed for the second wave of COVID-19 by not abiding by lockdown rules, wearing masks, social distancing, and so on. Uh, people are blamed for the obesity crisis. Uh, we're told to eat more healthily and take more exercise. Uh, we're told we need to get a good job and save to buy a house. Uh, rough sleepers are drug addicts or alcoholics and they brought their homeless condition on themselves. Uh, we need to gamble responsibly and, and so on. And I argue in the book that while people are responsible for the choices they make from their uh, menu of opportunities, government is largely responsible for setting the menu itself. Government is responsible for the social outcomes, the outcomes we see in statistical evidence of society at large. It's government that regulates us and it sets the incentives for how people behave. Now my book looks at five areas of government policy. They're chosen since they're relatively self-contained and it looks at the policies in, in, in a bit more detail in three countries, the United Kingdom, the USA and Australia. The five issue areas I look at are gun crime, obesity, housing, gambling, and recreational drugs. I begin with gun crime because it's, uh, it's relatively easy to show that regulations governing gun sales have a large effect on gun crime, on, on death and injury rates, on accidents and on suicide rates. Now, of course, that book talks a lot about the USA, and many people outside of the USA think that their gun regulations are far too lax. But politicians there continually blame gun crime on bad guys or irresponsible gun ownership. In the US, from 2014 to today, about 14,300 people die each year from gun injuries. About 2,000 of these are under the age of 17, and about 675 per annum or under the age of 11. With about 22,600 people uh, injured annually, and with gun-related accidents, uh, incidents at about 55,000 per year, these are enormous numbers. Now I argue that we know we can reduce murders, suicides, accidents and injuries from firearms with stricter regulations. In the USA, the precise regulations uh, uh, governing gun sales vary from state to state, but only for automatic weapons are they subject to similar regulations we find in other countries. In the USA, there is no firearm registration. 
Dealers must keep registers of their sales, but private sales are allowed for which no records need to be kept. And while some states require a permit to carry guns, others do not. Now regulations over guns vary across other countries, but what we see from these regulations is that some seem to matter. Background checks on mental health, criminal records, and records of domestic violence. These matter. Good character references are required in some countries and they seem to have a marginal effect. Private sales of weapons are banned in most countries, which allows governments to keep proper records of who own guns and ensures the regulations are kept and that we have registration of all weapons. And other countries have much stricter regulation of semi-automatic assault rifles. Now these gun regulations have different sorts of effects. For example, bans on firearm purchases by minors affect suicide rates amongst younger males. Whilst permits and waiting periods seem to deter older people from suicide. Restrictions on those with drug and alcohol problems also reduce the suicide rate. Keeping guns away from petty criminals affects the accident rate. No one is sure why, but one hypothesis is that petty criminals tend to be less careful than other people. Mental health and domestic abuse checks reduce the murder rate. So we see from all of this, regulations matter. Now, in fact, a majority of Americans support the right to bear arms, though they do not necessarily support the precise gun laws that exist today. But all I ask of citizens and politicians is to take responsibility for the rights they want to maintain. They should, after a gun massacre, or if they're presented with the death and injury uh, 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 statistics from guns, they should say, well, these things happen, given our current gun laws. And we want these gun laws. So we, as politicians, take full responsibility for these social outcomes. If American systems, system, citizens want their current gun laws, they have to take responsibility for the outcomes. That's the argument. Now, obesity is a topic that many people assume is up to personal responsibility. They think, think so because they compare their eating and exercise habits with other people. And they either blame other people for being overweight or they blame themselves for their body shape. Well, body shape is sometimes described as a lifestyle choice. However, we, however, we have to ask, why has obesity become a problem over the past 50 years? Again, let's think of some figures. Around 28% of the British population is officially obese with another 35% overweight. Obesity is estimated to reduce life expectancy by about two years, and by, by about eight to 10 years for those with a BMI of 40 or more, that's the body mass, in, body mass index. The estimated cost to the National Health Service are about five billion pounds per annum, and to the economy of about 17 billion. Now, year on year increases in obesity in the population correlate with about a 15% increased calorific intake. And this is largely due to in the increased consumption of grains, added fats and sugars, mostly due to canned fruit and sugar sweetened beverages, SSBs as they're known. Now a high calorific intake is associated with SSBs, not only because they're highly calorific, um, well, indeed some of them are not, but they give um, a heightened sweet alertness to frequent consumers who then consume greater um, quantities of high calorie solid food. And there are also replacement effects with SSBs. Consumers drink less water and milk and they eat less fresh fruit. Now, why is there increased consumption of SSBs and, high, SSBs and highly processed foods? Why has it increased so much over the last 50 years? Well, there's two reasons. First, they're more readily available. Secondly, their price has dropped enormously relative to healthy food. While the price of food overall has fallen around 15% in the last 30 years, the price of fresh fruits and vegetables has risen by about 120%, fish by about 75%, and dairy products by about 55%. So the drop in food costs is explained by big falls in meat, prepackaged and prepared foods, and soft drinks. Now the problem is caused in part by food fan manufacturers finding out what appeals to us. And some of this is due to our evolutionarily developed tastes. Sugar is actually highly addictive and quite hard to quit if it's consumed in large quantities. 
Other additives increase the length of, uh, of, of food shelf life, but decrease the length of human life. And we can't blame food manufacturers for putting in these additives and adding these sugars and designing food which appeals to our evolutionary developed tastes. They're in a competitive business and they develop their products to appeal to us because they're in competition with each other. But my book argues that government needs to regulate such additives, ban trans fats as some countries have done, tax sugar and other sweeteners, salts and additives. Now Britain has made some moves in this direction, but they're not enough. The blame for the obesity crisis, I lay at the door of lax government regulation over food manufacture. Blaming obesity on personal responsibility is particularly pernicious. This is a form of individual fat shaming. But the obesity crisis is the government's responsibility. Now, another chapter I have is on housing. And the modern housing crisis has also arisen from government policy. In the past 50 years, government has seemingly got out of the business of providing low cost social housing, while fiscal policy has fueled house price inflation. It is biased towards owning rather than renting properties. Homeowners are subsidized relative to renters. Now we've seen from the 1980s, the right to buy policy in the UK, uh, reduce the amount of social housing. Removing rent control was supposed to stimulate the private rental market and encourage house building. But builders and private renters prefer to provide properties at the mid to top range of rents and social house bills have fallen. Governments provide strong incentives for people to buy property, both for second or holiday homes for rent. In Australia, the incentives for borrowing and to claim tax write-offs give strong incentives for buying property to rent to such an extent that investment gains from property mean that people are prepared to buy properties and leave them empty. These policies have caused in the UK, for example, house prices to rise fourfold in real terms in the last 40 years. Rents too have skyrocketed. Affordability has dropped dramatically with only around 30% of new households able to buy in the last decade compared to 45% in the mid 1980s. Today, for the first time in the post-war period, young people are less likely to ever own their own home than were their parents. In Australia, over 15% of taxpayers are now landlords, collectively losing the Commonwealth the Australian government, nearly $8 billion in tax write-offs. Since 92% of such investors buy existing properties, they do little to increase the supply of affordable housing, but they contribute instead to the almost 1 million unoccupied dwellings in the major cities. That's equivalent to 11% of housing stock. In fact, there's more than enough housing for all Australians currently living in the country, and more than enough even in areas where most of the homeless dwell. When it comes to rough sleepers, again, the government does little to help. Alcohol and drug problems are associated with rough sleepers. But it's been shown in, Swindland, Swind in Finland, for example, that getting people into accommodation helps them to overcome addictions, to clean up, to get a job. The policy in the UK is the opposite. People are expected to clean themselves up before help is provided with housing. This is asking too much of people. So in all these areas, I'm saying that we tend to blame people, we put responsibility onto citizens, but government policy is really the root cause of the social problems. And my other two examples are a little bit different, and in part are designed to challenge my thesis. Gambling laws have been relaxed. And in doing so, they've created a great, greater number of problem gamblers. Now, I largely support this relaxation of gambling policy. A lot of people get pleasure from gambling. There's no reason why we shouldn't. But I argue that government regulation is misdirected. One problem is that much of the research on gambling is funded by the gambling industry. So they decide what issue to research on. And research is directed at helping problem gamblers. Government policy is to try to help problem gamblers. Instead, government should be regulating the design of uh, particularly electronic gambling machines or EGMs, 
that are designed to maximize revenue and in doing so are effectively designed to create gambling addicts. And it's been shown that EGMs are a major cause of problem, for a major way in which people first become problem gamblers. While the precise neurological mechanisms are not fully understood, we know that with gambling addiction, the brain's reward and pleasure centers become overwhelmed in a feedback loop that leads people to pathologically gamble for short-term reward. The brain's reward system responds to the way EGMs are set up for fast and continuous reward, which leads some people to become addicted. Now again, the gambling industry knows this. It's set these machines up in order to maximize their revenue. They're in a competitive business, of course they do that. But government needs to step in and it needs to regulate the way in which the gambling industry hooks problem gamblers rather than just helping people once they become problem gamblers. Now, recreational drugs is, a, is an area where, again, it's rather different from my other uh, cases. In the other cases, I'm saying that government, in what people would normally see as paternalistic policy, they should do more for people. Whereas in recreational drugs is an area where government is still paternalistic in a, in a manner they're not in my other areas. However, I argue that the war on drugs, as it's been called, has been lost. And I look at evidence that suggests that legalization, along with regulation, might not appreciably increase the number of people taking drugs, but would help us to control drug use, control quality, and better help those whose lives are ruined by them. In other words, I'm saying that what a legalization would do would enable better government regulation. So the main thrust of the book is that in all of these areas, we can see that government regulations have either failed to keep up with what the industry is doing, notably in food manufacture and in gambling, we might say the black market in drugs, or in the housing area where government itself created the housing and homelessness crisis by its uh, um, changing its policies on providing social housing and on its fiscal policies. The point which I think many do not appreciate, and this is the main sort of argument of the book, is that while people are responsible for the choices they make, we can only hold them responsible for the, for the choices made from the reasonable alternatives they have available. Furthermore, government knows that people are not angels, and they should take that into account in regulation in all fields. After all, when we, uh, you know, we regulate for crime, we know people aren't angel angels when we have laws against crime. To go back to COVID-19 for a moment, why do we ask people to wear masks in public? Why don't we enforce the, the wearing of masks? The idea that some suggest is that there is some kind of human right not to have to wear a mask is frankly ludicrous. Rights are about important liberties such as free speech. Is there a human right not to have curtains in your home? I think people appreciate why we need blackout in wartime, and they ought to appreciate the same kind of direction in a pandemic. So that's the argument of my book. It's that in many areas, government thrust responsibility for the bad uh, outcomes we get, the bad social outcomes we have on citizens. And in actual fact, the fault really lies with government and it's lack of regulation or it's poor regulation. Thank you, Keith, for that very uh, clear overview of your book. And we'll now move into the um, questions um, and find out your answers. First question asks, could you talk more about the current example of COVID-19 and how the government is changing its policies to blame individuals for the increase in cases? Um, yeah, I mean, COVID is actually quite a difficult um, uh, policy area. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area where um, um, government, uh, when it first arose, uh, it wasn't clear, the experts, science wasn't absolutely clear what we should do. I mean, the first sort of advice was about washing your hands, and then later on we've been saying, well, um, 
uh, airborne uh, carrying of COVID is, is more important and masks are very important. And also, uh, we've had different policies uh, by different countries. Some have had very strict lockdowns and, uh, and others not. We look at the case of Sweden, which is, I think, the jury is still out about how bad or good their policy has been. So it's actually quite a difficult area. But you're quite right. I think certainly in Britain, I mean, I have to point out to you, I, I live in Australia, but um, in Britain, it certainly does seem to be the case that government has not had a consistent strategy. Uh, it's sort of been changing its its mind and had these U-turns, and it certainly seems to be blaming people. And I think it needs much clearer direction. And really, the government does need to take responsibility for the sorts of um, for its policies. And certainly, I mean, the way why it's happening is they're sort of announcing policies without really finding out whether or not um, you know they have the means to implement them. Um, uh, uh, Johnson was talking about it, 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 this big sort of testing regime, and it's clearly the case that, that there's not the resources there to do it. So it is a, it is a major problem, yes. Thank you. Um, next question. Which do you think is worse, the lack of guidance from government in the first three examples or the uh, paternalistic attitudes in the second two examples? Oh, which is worse? I think one of the problems I'd like to say is that I'd like to get away from this sort of paternalism nanny state kind of argument and just say, well, look, what government should be doing is doing what it's, what it's best for its citizens, looking for the welfare of its citizens. And it should be making those sorts of, those sorts of decisions. I th think in the book I say, I give an example of, you know, if, if your child comes home from, from school being bullied, um, is saying to the child, well, you've got to stand up for yourself, or is saying, oh, let's go and talk to the, to the, to the head teacher. Which of these is more paternalistic? Is one more paternalistic than the other? I don't see that, you know, what government should be doing is trying to uh, develop policies which provide incentives for people to work in ways which uh, are best for them and best for the community as a whole. And I think they're failing to do this in, in certain regards. Part of what the argument of the book is about is that um, we actually do know stuff and that we could be doing better. One of the perhaps... Um, Criticisms of the book, which I try to answer in the final chapter, is actually some of the issues that I'm looking at aren't as clear as I make out. And that might be true. Um, you know, things are difficult. But I think in, in the areas that I've chosen, it's fairly clear what the problems with, the ha with housing is. I do think that it's fairly clear now what the problem with, the, with, with, the, with obesity is. I mean, again, what you find is that there is dispute between experts. Um, so, for example, with obesity, for example, you do find some a dispute about what are the worst additives and how far um, it's the, the food we eat and how much the lack of exercise really is causing the sort of the degree to which they both create the obesity crisis. But we do know that um, these additives are causing problems. So I think we shouldn't not act because there is some dispute, some marginal dispute over these sort of over these sort of differences. So I don't want to say that while government's worse in one area rather than another, it should be more paternalistic, should be less paternalistic. I think we need to look at what good regulation will be based on the best knowledge that we have. Thank you. Um, we've got two related questions really to do with the way uh, media interacts with government. The first is what percentage of the problem is the way the media reports the government advice? And how much control does the government have over the way these stories are reported? Um, and sort of related question is what steps can be taken to reframe government versus individual responsibility? For example, will it be hard to enlist media support as by bad guy stories are easily sensationalized? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. Yes, I mean, I do think there is um, um, uh, an issue with the media, as the as the last um, uh, question said, that you know it's very it's, it's it's nice for you know it's easy for the media to to pick on people and to and to and, and to and to blame us, um, and of course you know a lot of social commentators like to say uh, you know blame certain groups of people for their problems. They pick up these problems and they blame groups of people, and they talk about. Um, you know, so you get some social commentators that suggest that people don't take enough responsibility because the government's such a nanny state, because the government is so paternalistic, people don't look after themselves. So they're actually blaming the government for being too paternalistic. What these commentators fail to explain is why these problems have become greater as government 
has done less in social fields, these problems have got greater. Why is it be becoming less paternalistic and making people less responsible? Well, I would say it's not making people less responsible, it's just giving them worse options, a worse menu of opportunities for them to choose from, which is why they're, they're not choosing so well. So, um, yes, I do think the media has, has, uh, has, uh, has got a lot to blame. Um, I mean, the, we, you know, my book isn't about problems in the media, but, you know, one of the problems that we have actually in Australia as well as the UK is the monolithic nature of the press and the monolithic nature of the media owned by very few people with very particular interests in pushing particular lines. Uh, rather than having a broader debate with more sets of, with a, great, a greater sets of opinions. I mean, again, you know, we could talk about should there be greater regulation of the media? And, um, and I, I would, you know, I mean, the, again, you know, one of the problems, what we've had is this sort of argument is we've got to have liberty, we want to have free markets, we want to regulate markets less. But actually, uh, when markets are unregulated, they tend to become, in many, many areas, they tend to become monopolistic. And that's what we've had with the media. And there was a time when government intervened much more to try to ensure that um, markets didn't become so monopolistic and become so dominated by a few um, um, uh, organizations. And that's one of the problems that we have in the media. How do we overcome it? Well, what, what we do is um, people like me write books, you read them, you tell everyone what a good argument, what a good idea it is. And, you know, it gets disseminated around uh, uh, over uh, amongst the public. Uh, no, I mean, uh, the only, only way we can try to overcome this is to talk about it, is to argue the case, is to challenge, you know, uh, uh, the media and to say, well, why are you blaming us? Why aren't you blaming government? Why aren't you doing your job properly? You should be uh, looking and criticizing government and actually looking at what's going on. So that, that's the only way we can do it. I have to say my book is also partially directed at, um, you know, my own field, political philosophy, which I think has brought far too much into the, the, the notions of personal responsibility. Uh, and often, you know, it writes so much about personal responsibility when it doesn't really look at political philosophers and you know, they should be writing about politics they're not writing enough about government they're writing too much about personal responsibility and personal freedom and i think that answers both those questions um here's quite another one do you think the issue is one of a failure of the political system where those who are in positions of political power do not represent normal people and therefore have no real understanding of the challenges people face and suggesting that housing might be a good example of this. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, a, as Stephen said, I'm, a, I'm a, a professor of political science and political philosophy. And um, if I was writing a book about why government fails under my sort of political science hat, uh, it would probably be called something like, um, it's special interest stupid or something like that, because the book will be saying, why does government behave as it does? Well, it does it because it's captured by special interests, it's captured by the media. Um, there are issues in uh, you know, our electoral system, there's, there's, uh, there are issues in our representative system. And I try and explain why it is that government uh, perhaps doesn't behave in ways which are to the welfare of, of, of everyone. Um, so, and I might you know, look at trying to answer some of those questions and some of those problems. This book is really saying that, well, you know, even if we can kind of causally explain why governments don't do as we'd like, um, that doesn't mean they're not responsible. They, they can, you know, the, even if, um, uh, I mean, so let's take, um, I mean, I mentioned um, selling off council housing, the right to buy. It was a very popular policy. And politicians might say, well, you know, what's wrong with us doing a very popular policy? Um, you know, we're doing what the electorate wants. Well, there was a bit of a, a, a subplot to it. The Conservative Party at the time knew that they were um, uh, turning sort of Labour voting uh, 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 council house vo uh, voters into private house owners in, in the future, be more interested in interest rates, which is a Conservative sort of owned policy. So they'd be turning them perhaps into Conservative voters. But they were doing something which was very popular. And you can say, well, what's wrong with that in a, in a democracy? So you know, governments can say, well, we sometimes do what, you know, we're doing what people want and people vote for us. And, you know, so what's the problem? But the argument is that, look, 
even if even if those things are the case, you still have to take responsibility for the social outcomes that we're having. It doesn't matter the reasons why government does it does as it does. We can still call them out for their bad policies, for their policies which are bad for people's welfare, for the for the poor regulatory uh, uh, processes. Okay, I think we're coming to um, the end of our time. So uh, we've got a couple more questions here, which um, I'll ask Keith to. Um, answer as, as briefly as he can, but uh, as interestingly as he's able. And uh, if there are any final questions, do quickly send those in and we'll see if we've got time for those as well. Um, is, is the problem, this question asks, uh, more prevalent uh, in one or more political philosophy? I think it sort of means one political ideology or you know, pl certain political parties, or is it a problem more generally of government rather than of politics? Yeah, I mean, I do think that, that there is a sort of... Um an ideology which underlies this, which um, is, a, is libertarianism, the idea of individual rights, individual liberties, responsibility, you, people need to be a, a, autonomous. Um, that is, that those ideas aren't just, I mean, libertarianism is often associated with the kind of political right, but it also infects the political left. And you'll see amongst you know left-wing political philosophers a great deal of, dis of discussion of personal responsibility and, and you know how we should uh, how you know how government should behave in certain ways which increases autonomy and increases freedom and uh, and allows people to, to develop themselves as individuals and that's all very well but I think there is a problem that in thinking about individual liberty and responsibility so much we actually lose sight of the fact that government you know, society actually creates our our uh, our, our um, choice sets. Society creates the, the the opportunities that we have. Government is a major actor in this, and that's really it. Should be looking after our interests, looking after our looking after our liberties. So, you know, one of the things that I, I say in the book is I say, well, you know, if you're interested in liberty, one of the things against regulation that's often said is, well, if you regulate, then you're taking away someone's liberty, and of course you are. If you say you you know, you can't, but uh, 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 we're going to, um, we're going to ban certain um, additives in, in certain food products, then you're going to stop someone choosing a food product with those additives. In a sense, you reduce their liberty with regard to that one thing. But at the same time, if you regulate, even though you might re be reducing someone's liberty in one over one item, you're actually increase, you might be increasing their liberty overall. So we have need to look at all of these things on a sort of uh, on a sort of individual empirical basis to work out whether or not we can increase people's liberty by regulating rather than thinking it necessarily reduces it. So no, it's not just a particular party and it's not just sort of a way of government. It, it is a set of I ideas which, you know, are libertarian and we, which could, we could see as once being the sort of domain of the right, but really now it's quite general in, in political thought, both in uh, academia and in, in government circles. Interesting. Final question. Um, in the UK, regulation of the market is often given over to independent bodies such as Ofcom for media and communications. Do you agree that this is a way of governments evading social responsibility? Yeah, um, there is a sort of a move for government to blame shift by setting up independent bodies, sometimes emasculating them, um, making it, you know, setting the conditions under which they can operate. And then if things don't go right, um, they blame them. Having said that, I think that um, often independent bodies looking at uh, regulatory issues um, is the right way to go. But what you do need to do is to make sure that those uh, regulatory bodies operate within um, a set of criteria which enables them to do their job properly, not be emasculated. Um, I mean, it varies, you know, it's a, what you've asked me is a very big question and I, I don't, you know, I, I, can, I can't give you a very detailed answer, but I don't think there's anything wrong with independent bodies itself, but you're certainly right. One of the tricks of government is to blame shift by uh, setting up an agency and then if things go wrong, uh, they blame the agency, they sack, you know, they, they take away the contract or they sack the, the person in charge of it. If things go right, then they take the credit. Very good. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us at this Bristol University Press webinar. And thank you also to our speaker, Keith Dowding. Um, as he said, he's in Australia, so he stayed up very late to join us and we much appreciate it. 
Um, details of how to order his book, It's the Government Stupid, are available in the chat. Our next webinar is on the 8th of October with Rob Kitchen and Alistair Fraser, authors of Slow Computing. Please see our social media or website for further details. Thank you again.